The first thing I'd like to do, though, is to introduce you to truffles. Now, this may seem superfluous, but you'd be surprised at the number of people that think I'm talking about chocolates when I'm talking about truffles. And it, it, it's amazing how many people believe that's the case. Um, it's, a, it's a fungus um, that grows in association with the, the, the roots of host trees. It's a, it forms a mutually beneficial relationship with that host tree, and it, in exchange for sugars and carbohydrates, the, the truffle increases the uptake of um, nutrients from the soil. So it's a, a truly a mutually beneficial relationship. It is not parasitic, and the, the special thing about truffles is that because they live underground, they're actually quite drought and desiccation resistant. And that actually separates them quite different from your regular mushroom that requires very moist conditions and it, it, it grows very rapidly, expands, and it, it, it dries up in no time at all. So the truffle actually is interestingly uh, well adapted to the Australian environment. Because it does fruit underground and it's not conspicuous, it actually produces a smell to actually attract uh, fungivores, um, little marsupials or, or pigs or, or any other animal that likes to eat them. They'll fossic, fossic for the truffle, eat it, and then pass the spores through the alimentary canal and, and thus spread the truffles around. So that smells an integral part of the truffle actually being uh, spreading and, and establishing itself in an area. In many parts of Europe where the truffle is, is uh, quite prolific, the, the ground freezes in winter. And interestingly, the truffles that actually mature in winter have a much stronger smell, and we believe that to be that that's because actually that smell needs to penetrate the frozen earth. And I was in Spain only two weeks ago, where we were uh, harvesting truffles, and quite literally had to break the ice icy soil to get at the truffles. Unfortunately, those that were superficial in the soil, well, close to the surface, were actually frozen and uh, unfortunately weren't marketable. But if you get down a bit into the uh, unfrozen section of soil, it, the, the truffle's in really good form. There are some 64 species of, of truffles that are eaten around the world. Um, not all of them ha have brilliant culinary attributes, um, but nonetheless, there are a lot there. And I think also it's important to understand that um, Australian native trees have their own um, a suite of, of truffles or truffle-like organisms growing on the roots of the plants, serving exactly that same purpose of actually improving the uptake of nutrients from the soil for the, for the benefit of the host tree. We don't know of any of these Australian truffles that are actually of much interest to anybody, but small furry marsupials. In Australia, we've introduced um, several, well, quite, more than several, we've, uh, we've introduced both black and white truffles. Currently, we have five species of black truffle. This is not widely recognised and probably it's, um, it's probably an issue that we need to actually uh, promote because the, these different species of truffle have different uh, c uh, culinary qualities. And we also have um, four species of white truffle. Um, Tuba borki is a, an Italian white truffle that I, I personally grow in and, and have produced the first genetically confirmed um, uh, specimen in Australia. Um, the other species of, of white truffle, Maculatum dryophyllum and puberellum, and have limited culinary qualities. As with the Uncinatum estevum brumal and indicum in the, in the black um, variety of truffles. Well, these aren't half as cute as, as Julie's uh, little friends or, or even, even Colin's little cralings. But I'll tell you what, this plate full of truffles is just around about a, a kilogram uh, were harvested from my farm last season. We've got tuba melanosporum on, on the right, the black truffle, and tuba borki on, on the right. And that plate full at farm gate is worth close to $1,500. And when that ends up in, the, in, a, in a restaurant, we're talking probably somewhere between four and $6,000 worth on that single plate. 
So let's go back a bit and see how the industry actually developed. Um, in 1996, when I performed this um, economic evaluation on, be uh, on behalf of Rodic, it was there was a dearth of information available about truffles, and I think one of the one of the telling one, I, I realised this very quickly when I actually contacted A Bear's predecessor, A Bear, looking for information on what how many truffles Australia was importing. And I duly paid my uh, $100 for the information and uh, waited for a couple of weeks and the answer came through that Australia back in the early 90s was importing something like 2,000 tonnes of truffles. And I thought, I said, hang on, there's, there's something wrong here. My, my intelligence my, and my, my searching around and, and, and consulting with various restaurateurs and chefs indicates that maybe we might be doing maybe tens of kilograms. But you tell me 2,000 tonnes, there's something wrong here. And the problem was that truffles were considered so insignificant that they were actually listed as a miscellaneous import item that was being aggregated in with mattresses and gearboxes and, and all sorts of other things. So I, I said this information is actually not much good to me and they actually gave me my money back, which was, which was good. But interestingly, back in those days, there was very little science. There was a lot of mystery. There was a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, a lot of bulldust, really, about what constituted good conditions for growing truffles. But really, that, that did reflect a very poor understanding of the biology of the truffle. Customers and consumers back in those days knew very little, and so they weren't in a position to actually push and drive the industry to, in, in Europe as it was then to actually come up with the right answers. And it served the purposes of, of the marketers in, in Europe to actually maintain that mystery and, that, uh, and the mystique about uh, truffle growing. But interestingly, um, uh, the French took advantage of some of the, uh, of the access they had to truffles. And back in those days, they were importing 20 tonnes of Chinese truffles per annum and actually quietly losing them in the, in the system in France. But it's a really important thing to re recognise because they were, weren't being as clever as they could have been with regard to biosecurity and quarantine. And as a result of that, when early um, uh, scientists or uh, scientists in early in the Australian uh, industry's history started to import truffle spores from France to inoculate trees here, they accidentally introduced undesirable species, and particularly those other four species that you, I, I showed you on the, with the black, and, those, um, um, and, uh, and also you'll find that later, more recently, with the white truffles. So those, those unwanted species were introduced because of the lax quarantine regulations and, and biosecurity in France, and also the inability for, uh, for to separate effectively the different spores. And that dry spore technique um, was prevalent at the time. It was the most effective way of getting a large amount of, uh, of uh, inoculating a large number of trees and effectively taking the, the spores of the truffles, uh, bringing them out here, introducing them to the, to, to the uh, seedling of, a, of the host tree in a, a sterile medium, um, cultivating it, looking after it well in a greenhouse and then planting it out. But, um, it was amazing how effective some of those other species, particular tuba bramal, was in actually hitching a ride and establishing itself in the Australian industry. Back in those days, Australia hadn't produced anything. The first plantations went in in 1993 in Tasmania, and the first harvest was in 1999. And what did amuse me no end when I was around at the time was that the French simply would not believe that it was possible. You know, they just said it outright, you, you, this is not truffle. Um, so we had some interesting debates back in those days. So. 
let's move on 20 years to, nine, to last year, 2016. This is what a fully-fledged um, tuber melanosporum or perigord black truffle truffier looks like. These are oak trees in, in their prime. Um, you notice under the trees that there is, a, um, the, there is no grass, and that is a, a function of the um, activity of the truffle actually um, producing an allele chemical, a chemical that actually um, restricts and retards the growth of other plants. Um, this is a picture of my truffier. I'm growing the, the tuber borki on pine trees. And again, you'll notice under the trees, there's a, 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 a dead area where, again, we're get, I'm getting that, that same brulee effect. So let's have a look at what the industry looked like in last year. And it has certainly come on a long way since, uh, since, the, uh, since the early 90s. The rest of my talk will be devoted to tuber melon sporum, the Perigord black truffle, and it's remarkable what we've been able to achieve as an industry. We now have some 250 growers, or would-be growers, of truffles around Australia. Interestingly, um, less than 50% of them are actually growing anything, or at least producing any truffles, and it's quite conceivable that those, one, those that aren't may never. There are several reasons for that, but uh, I won't discuss that now. But what is fantastic in terms of world standards is that we've got truffle growers in Western Australia that are producing in excess of 500 kilograms of truffles per hectare, which is Truly remarkable. It's, it has to be more lucrative than some illicit drugs, I reckon. <laughs> but we do have issues, we do have problems. There are, given certain seasonal conditions and regional conditions, we can get as much as 50% rot in, that, in the, the truffle harvest. And that really has a big impact when you consider the, the worth of these, uh, these things. So we're now the fourth largest producer of truffles in the world, of tuber melanosporum, which is no mean feat in such a short period of time. We export some 85% of those truffles, primarily to, to the US, to, to Europe, and, and to Asia. And I think that um, given the, the, the size of the Australian population and the interest in truffles, we'll continue to export truffles. That will be our major opportunity for, to, for, to move the Australian harvest. So what does the industry look like in terms of, of, of its, its makeup and, and also in terms of what does this mean economically and financially? Well, truffles come, some of them are, are really nice and they're beautifully shaped and some of them are really rough and some are scratched by the dogs that, that dig them up and some are eaten by slugs and so there's actually quite a range of quality and the grading of truffles is a really important issue. But on average, at farm gate, a farmer will get around $950 a kilogram, uh, 95 cents a gram for, for the truffles. And that will vary between, um, say, 50 cents a, uh, a gram for, for um, I suppose, manufacturing grade quality, up to um, $1.50 or even more for uh, really well-formed, perfect truffles. As I mentioned the, um, the, earlier, there are at least referred to, there's a big markup when you move into the, uh, into the retail uh, side of the industry. And um, last year in, in Paris, some Australian black truffle were, were selling quite happily at the, uh, in, a, in a prestigious uh, truffle shop for um, over $5,000 a kilogram. But interestingly, the customers, it's the, the chefs and, and the restaurateurs and the consumers still have a very limited knowledge of truffles. And again, I'm not sure whether that's a function of or it's convenient for the industry globally to maintain that lack of knowledge, but it, it to me is a major concern because it actually is an impediment to us driving the quality issues really hard. If the consumer and the customer 
demands good quality and they know what they're looking for, we can then influence what the industry does. And interestingly, our growers, um, still uh, there's a, a large variety in the level of their understanding of what they're doing. And I have to say that many of our growers have no horticultural experience, no agricultural experience, and certainly no um, uh, mycological experience. And that presents a real challenge to us as an industry to make sure that they're all operating at, a, at an effective level that doesn't compromise the standards and I suppose the, the security of our industry. We have another issue in that the, the size of, and the distribution of truffle farms is, is quite, uh, quite variable. We have three very large farms with up to 38,000 trees. We have four medium-sized farms with up to 10,000 trees. And then we have some 150 or thereabouts small to medium growers with up to 3,000 trees and then some rats and mice with, with uh, you know, even fewer. The East Coast um, is certainly more boutique-y and we have many more growers over, over on this side, but it's Western Australia where the truffles are really uh, being uh, pr uh, produced in, in large numbers. And here's a, a breakdown on last year's harvest. With eight and a half, um, that's actually tons. Uh, no, it isn't. That's um, uh, no, it's kilograms. So eight and a half tons over in Western Australia, grown around Manjimup, and uh, with um, one and a half tons coming out of Tasmania, approximately. And then you can see the, distrib the distribution elsewhere. It's too early for South Australia to produce anything. They've actually established some trophy years, but uh, it's still too early for them to have uh, produced anything. But it's interesting to compare the tuber melon sporum production in Australia compared with New Zealand that produced some 200 kilograms in total last year. They actually started production of truffles some four or five years earlier than Australia and certainly they, were, they took the jump on, on the scientific improvement but the, the industry unraveled for all sorts of different reasons and now they're actually producing more tuber bromal that lesser grade quality truffle um, than tuber melanosporum. And this is what production, this is what the production history looks like. From 1998 when there, was, there were no truffles in Australia up to um, 13 tonnes uh, uh, last year. And I've extrapolated conservatively here, presuming that the truffiers that are already established actually do come into production. And some of them may not. So it's a reasonably conservative estimate or prediction on, on where our production will go in the next few years. So in terms of the Australian industry, we need to actually look at it in terms of, in the context of the global industry, because we are exporting the bulk of our truffles. And it's interesting to note, and I think one of the great advantages is that we're producing truffles out of season. We could, and there's nothing better than a fresh truffle. If you're ever offered a truffle, go fresh every time. It's a much better product than anything that's been, that been pickled or canned or, or, or mixed and mashed or with something else. Go for fresh. And so we're able to put fresh truffle into Europe peak uh, in right out of season and it com competes directly with the 50 percent or so of of European product or truffle that is turned into preserved product down in the down that bottom line there I make reference to that 50 percent of the European production is pickled so we're putting a, a, a top quality product and competing into Europe and competing with a uh, sort of a traditional interesting um, product. The natural harvesting of truffles in, in uh, Europe is, is uh, seriously declining and a hundred years ago in France alone they harvested a thousand tons of truffles per year. 
And for various reasons, that production has declined significantly to the point where in a bad year, um, France might produce 15 tonnes. Um, in a really good year, they might go to 80 tonnes. Similarly, um, Italy uh, has a highly variable production from 10 to, to 80, and Spain from 5 to 80 tonnes. Again, that's highly dependent on the, um, on the uh, climatic conditions or seasonal conditions. Interestingly, the, the European growers are, are depending more so on traditional methods of managing their trophies. And, and so, in fact, we've got an edge on them because we don't have that tradition in Australia. We've had to develop our trophier or, or truffle or, uh, orchard management from scratch. And also substitution of, with different species in Europe is still rife. There are, there are issues about quality assurance and Interestingly, um, the, the French are getting interested in applying tariffs to the import of Australian truffles. So the threats, um, there are um, in the context of that European opportunity and our export opportunities to the US, um, it's really important that we actually maintain the integrity of the in industry and its reputation. We need to be aware that um, there are a lot of trophies being established in South Africa and in Peru that will compete directly with us. Um, there's also, um, it's already starting to happen in that the Peruvians are starting to try to move truffles into Australia and elsewhere at a reduced price. So there's going to be some, some fierce uh, competition there. Also, one, uh, it's a, a personal warning, but also it's something that everybody needs to be aware of, and that is the indiscriminate use of 2,4-dithiopentane, which is truffle aroma. You'll find it everywhere. It's ubiquitous, and it's used to actually um, enhance the flavour of truffles, but it's, it, it gives people the wrong impression. And uh, again, it's a, a, I could do a, do a whole hour on, on, on the impact of that on the industry. Again, we need to be aware of the fact we still haven't got through to the customers and our consumers. And on top of that, we've also got biosecurity issues with regard to pests and diseases and the opportunity to, for incursions of truffle diseases coming in from overseas. So, to, to wind it up, basically, uh, if we're going to maintain our position in the global industry and uh, make the most of those, uh, our production opportunities, we need to investigate and are investigating cooperative marketing. And, and the first small truffle cooperative has been established or is being established in New South Wales right now. That helps the smaller growers to actually put together a marketable bundle of truffles and be able to guarantee supply to, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, restaurants and elsewhere. Um, it's really important that we have a common adoption of, of quality standards that, that will enable us as an industry to actually represent fairly and evenly across the board different qualities of truffles. And again, we need to educate our customers and consumers if we're going to make the most of it, our industry. With the help of um, various organisations, we're driving through on these various initiatives to actually help our industry with a, with a grower's guide, a best, a, 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 a how best to grow truffles, um, a pest and diseases guide, uh, biosecurity has been addressed and we're uh, almost signatories to Plant Health Australia's deed. Um, we're improving our communications with, with truffle growers, but also in increasing the number of uh, uh, truffle fairs and festivals that, um, to help promote an understanding of truffles. And we're also looking in informative stages of, of looking to develop an R&D and marketing levy. Now, it's going to be a doozy of a, of a challenge to me as the president to actually bring that about, but it's something I would like to see happen. So just to fin finish off, uh, there are a lot of people that are involved in the industry and a lot of good scientists, and these are, are some of them representing both state and federal organisations. And also there are many private growers that have, have contributed their time and effort to actually help with the, with the science that's being done in Australia. And I'd be remiss without acknowledging the fantastic financial support we get from all of these different organisations, but make, I'll make particular mention of Rodic, who have been behind the industry right from the outset. Their support to the industry has been fantastic over the years, and, and to Rodic, thank you very much, and to all of you, thank you very much.